just trying to figure out if others want to join. Okay, I think we're good. So, welcome to our first spotlight. There are three spotlights, as you know. Um, this spotlight is about nature and colonial subjugation after, as I think, a very strong opening panel, we shift, we shift our focus to a bit of um, different, a different subject, but very much, in, very much in the same line of discussion. Transfigured dreams and spaces, nature and colonial subjugation. Before we start, I, um, I have to inform you that one of our panelists, Dr. Bernhard Giesebel, cannot be with us today. Um, you have seen his name in the program. He has a bereavement case in his family and informed us last minute that he wouldn't be able to be with us. So we have to do without him. But I do think our panelists uh, very much uh, will cover some of the topics and the subjects um, that Bernard would have talked about. Now, in, in German, in so-called German East Africa, in, the colonial, in, in, the, uh, in, in colonial times, nature conservation was an integra integral part of the colonial project. It was part of the exploitation and oppression that came with that system. Um, nature, fauna and flora uh, was preserved in designated areas and declared, declared as wilderness. Um, beyond, it was closely linked to land seizure, displacement and destruction of traditional forms of economy and I would say also traditional forms of living. Until today, these violent in intervention left strong marks on the landscape in the country um, and have a massive impact on tourism. Uh, they are a very important subject and focus of development cooperation, I believe, and of private conservation initiatives. So this is the, this is the topic of um, of the spotlight of our panel here. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. To my right, we have Dr. Leiber Kalanga Moko. Uh, Dr. Leiber is an anthropologist um, doing postdoctoral research at the a center at the Freie University uh, Freie Universität Berlin Free University Berlin. Um, at the Center of Collaboratory Research. Um, the program, I think, it's called Effective Societies. Um, Leiber conducts research on effective dynamics during encounters of uh, communities. I think uh, the, we can say the Maasai community in particular, um, with colonial appropriated objects from their former po uh, possessions. You can um, learn more about it, as, as I did, in interesting videos you have on your website or the website of that particular project, which exactly shows uh, what, what I try to describe here. Welcome with that, uh, with that today, Leiber. <laughs> we have Jimson Sanga. Um, Jimson Sanga is from Iringa in southern uh, Tanzania. Um, he works at the lecturer at the university there at the Department of Cultural uh, Anthropology and Tourism. He also co-directs a regional museum. We had this question before about other museums that are not uh, official museums or um, in, in museums belonging yeah, to the state. Um, so this museum is such a museum, I believe. Um, this museum works on conservation and promotion of cultural heritage um, and um, is located in the so-called BOMA, the, the, the administrative building that the German colonial system used uh, in, in, that, um, in that region. 
um, um, Jimson also does with um, with the museum and your organization. You also do provenance research um, in collaboration with German museums and universities. Um, we have Linda Popper. Yes, a warm, sorry, a warm welcome to Jimson. We have Linda Popper with us. Um, Linda is the Managing Director of Survival International Germany, um, an NGO that launched the Decolonize Nature, Decolonize Nature Conservation, I should say, campaign, which advocates for an approach to nature con con uh, conservation and climate protection that focus on indigenous communities and indigenous peoples, I believe. Um, and you did extensive work and advocacy on human rights violations of communities in, in Tanzania. So, welcome to Linda. So we will, we will start our, our panel with a short input from Leiber about uh, the, the question of nature constructed nature, um, na nature parks um, that um, were declared as, um, as, as a natural space uh, free of human activities and uh, your experience or, and, and, and your, your research on the communities who live in these areas, areas that were designated by the German colonial administration as such, as nature parks. Labour, please, and yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joachim. And um, thank you everyone for um, coming to this panel. And uh, maybe I shall start by uh, making it clear that um, um, as you had, I deal with the question of colonialism, uh, but from the perspective of uh, ethnographic museums, um, basically, you know, focusing on part of the collections from Tanzania. And uh, speaking about Tanzania, there are so many uh, uh, ethnic groups. And so, yeah, um, it's, it's also a big, a big kind of a question. But... Um, so I'm um, not uh, an expert in conservation from this, I mean, the Western um, concept of conservation. But um, I would rather think of myself as a, a, um, um, maybe a victim of Western um, concept of conservation. So I will be talking pretty much uh, from uh, uh, the experience. And I must also declare that I'm from a Maasai community. So I'm a Maasai myself. And uh, it's one of the marginalized uh, 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 indigenous uh, communities in uh, Tanzania and whatever. So, yeah, so, uh, but then conservation and ethnographic museum, I think they are not really different, uh, uh, if you like, different institutions, I think they are together, you know, because in the museum we basically speak of conservation and in nature it's also about conservation. So I think uh, there's really no clear line when it comes to um, discussing about this. And um, to speak about a little bit of history of conservation, so I won't go so much deep, but um, just to tell you that it's really, really a colonial um, um, practice or whatever discourse, and um, our German colonialism, um, it's, it's at the center of this, especially uh, when we talk about conservation in Tanzania, um, nature uh, conservation in Tanzania. And um, um, it was uh, something that uh, was brought to Tanzania during German colonial time. And uh, 
many of the people who, at least the colonial um, agents who uh, did that, are the same people that we are uh, kind of uh, discussing in, 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 in uh, let's say, in other discussions that we had, especially um, the first session. And um, I think Bernard, uh, one of the presenters, uh, um, told us about uh, uh, one of the uh, colonial uh, officers. Uh, was um, his name is um, Herman von um, Wiesmann, I think. So that was very interesting because he really he was an imperial governor in Tanzania, and. Uh, he really played a very, very big part in, uh, especially in the establishment of uh, um, um, this idea of conservation from a Western perspective, uh, creation of, particularly creation of uh, game reserves, you know, which are like these spaces where you know you don't have people. You really separate humans from um, from uh, wildlife. And uh, that's how you can you can keep wild animals and uh, of flora and fauna um, safe. So, um, and I think that's that's uh, in that sense we at least we speak of colonial conservationism or fortress conservation, if you like. And uh, I think that's the whole topic that you know um, um, this creation of uh, spaces. Uh, that are free of people, uh, with the ideology that you know people destroy the environment. People are, are enemies to wild animals. So, um, so um, the first uh, general wildlife ordinance for in German East Africa, as you said, uh, dates back to 1896. And I think this this was like uh, just six years after our um, formal German colonialism in East Africa. And uh, as I said, Hermann uh, von Wiesmann was really like the initiator. And uh, he wanted to secure, you know, um, the, the chance for future generations to find leisure and recreation in African hunting in uh, yeah in, in the future. So uh, that we speak of, uh, you know, conserving, you know, so that the future generation can really have places where they can go for hunting. And I think that's a very interesting also way to think of conservation in colonial time. The idea of hunting was at the center. And I think most of the um, colonial officers who came up with the idea were hunters themselves. So they, they could really think of, you know, this ideology that, you know, uh, future generations uh, would love to um, um, to do that. And I, I didn't mention, but uh, Wiesmann was uh, from Frankfurt and the order, and he was a military officer for um, German uh, German uh, imperial government, and uh, he also inv he was involved in many many uh, expeditions uh, somewhere really um, terrible. Uh, in the coast, but also in other places. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so you can see from him that he introduced this idea of our hunting reserves, and it's, it's uh, um, so it dates back to then. And um, also others, uh, colonial officers uh, supported the idea. I'm thinking of uh, Carl George Schillings, was born in uh, Duren, Germany also. And um, he, he had this idea that we create these uh, nature spaces so that we can bring like wealthy hunters from uh, um, abroad, from Germany, Europe, whatever. And uh, with that, you know, um, you know, we can do business with that. And that, that's, that was the idea. That, the business could be conducted in such a way that it would really contribute so much in or what could be spent to um, um, really colonize further and you know um, extract from the colonies. So you see, you see, yeah, that, that was a, so. And by 1911, because uh, 
don't want to go much into uh, history, but um, you know that uh, German colonialism ended uh, soon after the World War I, um, when the then Tanganyika was passed to uh, Britain, uh, so it became like a British colony. But by 1911, um, German uh, imperial government in Tanzania, uh, then Tanganyika, declared already like 15 protected areas uh, as, uh, you know, um, game reserves or hunting reserves. And you could, yeah, we, we can really trace this to very famous uh, parks like Selous in a, in a, in a, in a it's, it's more to the, um, in, in, in Tanzania. And, uh, and uh, the park itself was named after the, uh, this Victorian adventurer. His name was Frederick uh, Courtney Selous. This goes the same to, for Serengeti, you know, it was first declared as a, a game reserve and then promoted into, you know, a um, national park later. It's the same for Ngorongoro, and I hope that you are familiar with uh, all that has been happening in all these places. And you could think, I mean, this, this, you could also think afterwards how German played a role in that, especially thinking of uh, people like Bernard Jimmick, you know, and I mean, you celebrate him here, but I mean, the stories back in Tanzania are quite different. And unfortunately, that's not the side that you would hear when you make a wonderful trip to Tanzania. But, uh, you know, he wanted to, create, I think he even coined this term uh, about Ngorongoro as a wonder of the world, you know. And um, yeah, many, 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 a lot to speak about really this creation of nature, you know, where you can just go and be like in a, this wilderness, you know, and uh, enjoy as much as you like. And uh, maybe to connect that to uh, very shortly, yeah. uh, this is very present. I, I mean, um, I think Dr. Shule spoke about colonial um, regulations, uh, laws at the present, especially when it comes to the film industry. And I think this applies the same to um, laws in, in, in terms of uh, conservation in Tanzania. They are very much colonial. And even the present creation of uh, whatever national park, this wilderness without people is really following the very same approach, especially these forceful uh, evictions, you know, brutal, you know, really brutal approach to conservation. And, um, you know that that connects much to you know and that, to the panel. I mean to this panel that you're talking about uh, nature and colonial subjugation, not just as something of the very past, like in eighteen late eighteen uh, hundreds, but uh, also a very present thing uh, as uh, as we can uh, think about it uh, right now. And what I find interesting is that simply a change of how we um, rationalize that, you know, how we justify uh, whatsoever the violence and um, abuses and uh, killings, et cetera, that are happening, especially a move from an economic kind of uh, ground, as we, could, as we have seen from colonial officers to this idea of uh, wildlife conservation and I think this is because this, that's what uh, the international community would love to hear. So it's really easy to sell in our um, um, evictions in, in the name of wildlife conservation and nature, etc. So Thank probably, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Labour. <laughs> I think that was an important statement and took us back to the origins, but of course, of uh, the origins of. Um, of these um, nature parks and and what they mean today um, and how the legacy of German colonialism is playing out uh, today for a significant part of um, of the Tanzanian. I would like, um, Linda, I would like um, to come to you with this question. Leiber gave us a background um, historically how were the parks established and what they mean for people and people who lived in them. So from your perspective and from the perspective of your work, 
how does uh, this legacy um, play out um, also in terms of human rights and the rights of communities who live and who live there today? Well, thank you very much uh, for the question and uh, Leibo for the statement. I think that's quite relevant. I don't know how familiar you are with the current situation of especially the Maasai in northern Tanzania. This is the area that survival uh, works on more heavily where um, there are several evictions going on in the name of conservation and also for tourism and trophy hunting, which is very closely connected in Tanzania, maybe in Tanzania more than in any other place in this world, which is also actually can be traced back to the famous German Bernard Schimek. But um, there are several conservation areas where there are plans for evicting Maasai. Um, the government partly says voluntary resettling them, which involves cutting social services like schools and health services, so basically forcing people off their land, uh, but not calling it forced evictions, which affects at the moment around 150 to 180,000 Maasai. And uh, recently there were plans leaked um, from the government that envision more of such evictions, which would basically cover everything that was considered Maasai land in northern Tanzania. So there would be a few more hundred thousand Maasai, which could be evicted in the name of conservation. So it's quite a quite an urgent issue. And these evictions are not, you know, they're not nice. Uh, people are being threatened, they're being arrested, they're being held in prison if they speak up. Um, there's a human rights activist that Survival has worked with who had to flee the country very recently because he spoke out against uh, these abuses. So it's a quite urgent thing. And of course we can ask, you know, what does that have to do with colonial German colonial influence, and I think Leibo already touched on this. And this is also something that I thought about before coming here. You know, what's my contribution or my learning I can give to you? And I guess my contribution is that I am a typical German, and when I was brought up, I knew everything about African wildlife. At least I, I thought so. I knew about elephants and giraffes and where they lived in Africa and that they were threatened. And from the TV shows I watched and the articles I read or the Disney movies I saw, I always knew that the wildlife is threatened by people. That was my impression I had. When people appeared in the picture, it seemed like nature wasn't protected properly. And this is a very old colonial myth. And when I grew up, I mostly learned that the most problematic people in the picture are black people. If they're white people, they're mostly experts and conservationists who want to protect wildlife. But the stories I heard was that black people are usually poachers or they're exploiting the wildlife. And that's a very strong narrative. If you look back at what the pictures and myths that you consume are, maybe you will find traces of these. They're still very alive and kicking in some of the public television series like Terra X, if you want to watch them they will tell you similar stories. And it's a, very, it's a very colonial story because it says that black people are destroying the environment, uh, that it's the white elite conservationists who will come to protect the land because the black people do not know how to manage their land. And in the worst case, it will be enforced with violence. So when I grew up, for example, I was quite used to the pictures of rangers carrying weapons to protect wildlife. And I saw that there was nothing wrong with rangers having extensive possibilities to arrest or even kill people with impunity in the name of conservation. Of course, when you look at these things and you try to think of them happening in, I don't know, the Bavarian forest here in Germany, you would think they would be outrageous. But because it's happening in Tanzania, for example, we think, well, you know, it has to happen because it's for wildlife. So there are these very strong myths that we carry and that we are being taught, which then translate into German politics and German, you know, initiatives by so-called civil society organizations like the Frankfurt Zoological Society, which is a very prominent conservation organization here in Germany, and they translate into policies which lead to the situations in which finance 
conservation projects which lead to the eviction um, of indigenous people like many Maasai communities in Tanzania. Thank, thank you, Linda. I think we come back to that aspect. Yes, please. Thank you, Linda. I think we come back to the aspect of funding and cooperation projects um, in, in this field. But I would like to come to Jimson and uh, who does work that is, um, that is a bit different but, and in a different region also um, of the country, but does nevertheless focus on memory work um, on the provenance research that you do, um, how and and um, a link to the colonial system that existed there. So, from your perspective, Jimson, how significant is this work, and how significant is the conversation of um, traditions, myth? and um, yeah, the, the, the traditional legends um, for what you do. Oh, thank you so much. Um, before I continue, maybe I should declare that I'm from Iringa, difference from the rest who mentioned coming from Dar es Salaam and Arusha, but I've been to these places. And I work for the University of Iringa that owns the community, or work with community to work with communities to establish this museum. We are talking about Iringa Boma, that connect by the building connect the German history, but what is inside as well is being built by community. So we use that as a learning lab to our students, primary school, secondary school, and the universities visiting and stimulating their uh, memories. But from there is when now our colleagues from Germany, they found us online that what we were doing, and they invited us if we could work with them, sharing some uh, object pictures. That they looked more or less similar from what we had in our museum. So this opened another door for us now to go around the country and expanding our own understanding while working with the uh, communities. So this is how it, it went for the museum and the objects in summary. But now for the question that you have asked that goes hand in hand with the land. This is a current that we started just last year. And our museum is only eight years old. So you can imagine how new it is. So we started last year working with the, the issue of land that goes back to the colonial history in terms of demarcations. And this is where justice uh, we got funds from the organization here in Germany, the Wittenhausen, mm -hmm. and it enlarged even our understanding that Wittenhausen was like a center for training uh, these people who went to work for the colonial farms. So they are the ones who were marking the land and doing this. And very unfortunate, when we went through in the northern part, in the Tanga region, Kilimanjaro region, Arusha region, locating those big farms. They're still the same, and the community around there are connected to that history orally from their forefathers. So it's like the demarcations that were made by German colony who were trained in Wittenhausen, they still exist until today, but in different forms. So it was for German East Africa at that time, and then during British colony, it was for settlers and then now there are private investments that are going on there. And what interested us is that to some of the places we found some old uh, information about the farm, like the introduction of coffee farm in Arusha, mm -hmm. the big one, the introduction of sisal in, in, in Tanga, and the introduction of rubber, rubber farm, that now the government is reintroducing the same product. But if you walk to the forest, you still found very old plants. But locals are the one telling us these stories, not reading from elsewhere. And then we had a big plantation in West Kilimanjaro where different uh, uh, weeds and other likes uh, were identified. But the interesting story to this is that locals are the ones who are revealing the information 
And if you read from the information existing in German, more, like, more or less they tell together. So you can see how much you are keeping the information in the boxes and in the rooms and libraries, but people are passing the same information to the community. So these are two different communities that are understanding the same. The interesting part when we went to West Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. to Maasai community now, we started by showing them the, the picture of the area. And they will, while we are sitting in a room, they will locate. No, this one is just next. We will show you. Let us go out. So it was like they are looking picture that exists for 100 years. And they, they can identify and they can tell you the story around it. Now, these people were trained in Witten housing. They collected even some objects from the place, from the people who lived the there. Mm -hmm. And then they brought to the, to the museum. And now it was another reason that they kept these objects in the museum without having information. We had to go and ask the community to ask them to participate. Do they understand anything about these objects? There are some terrible stories behind the narrations that went through these objects. For instance, someone couldn't take the, the part of, how do we call that, that you were in the West? The belt? The belt for the women, especially because that was a secret. If a person could question how could they dare to take these ones, and then there was some terrible information that we are given. So the project is still ongoing, and we are looking forward to see if we can discover more of the information that are linked to these uh, farms. And we are doing this in uh, working with communities. They are the ones who are giving us this information. And as you go deeper, more community they get involved, they tell you. But going back to the mythical protection of land, you asked that question. We thought we shouldn't be just this, uh, exhibiting the objects in the museum without involving the uh, more research into it. What the community is talking about it. This is where we came. We came with another project here before last year that is, go, is going by the name Endangered Stories in the Enchanted Places. So it was like asking the elders, like how do they, how do they work on their land protection? How do they conserve env environments? Like how do they understand the season, different types? And then there was so much information that these elders could tell their own way of protecting the environment. And it wasn't only in Iringa. If you go to other places as well, especially the community living adjacent to wildlife, they have their own way of protecting the animals and protecting their own families. But they use their own vocabulary. Sometimes if they want to talk of the water bodies, they will be declaring that underneath the water body, there is this giant snake, so don't go closer. So they had their own way of protecting whatever they're protecting. If we, when we asked the Maasai community, when we visited them, how do you work with wildlife, then somehow they tell their names. So their surnames comes from the animals. So animals are being treated as part of them. And the other issue, we, we thought now, how can we pass this knowledge now to now generation? So usually we use the young artisan, the contemporary artist, to, to, uh, to, to change this information now into an artistic drawing or artistic modeling. And then we display in the community last year, we launched another museum telling the story from the past into now. So this is how we do, and it works so well, and it encourages uh, people to come. So sometimes our, our museum used as a training lab to the community. They come in, they correct information. They come in, they ask more questions. But for the young ones as well. And so this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. To connect to that. Uh, Liber, to connect to what Jameson said, how... Um, how like 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 the communities recognize um, the, on these photos the the land etc. Is it in your research that you do with the communities? What how how would you describe the memories um, that are there? And um, 
and 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 uh, the, the memories to the times of colonialism and uh, what do they trigger today thanks um the memories to colonialism yes i so i, wa I also worked with the belongings the objects <laughs> let's say object that's why it's uh, because i we should question that very much mm. and um and uh, it's uh i'm even afraid of saying um uh, memory i think it's really um a very present um, um uh, circumstance so when i first of all i should uh maybe say that the mass i are uh, the people whom i worked with are uh, we are not aware of colonialism uh, until I brought them in the, the information about um, the pr presence of Maasai uh, collection in, in the Ethnological Museum in Berlin. Um, and um, so, and I have also to say that myself, I didn't know before. So when I came here first time in 2019, um, I came to work on uh, the objects from are uh, a famous Maji Maji O that we discussed in the previous session. And uh, to work in the context of the uh, project Contested Property. And thanks to COVID, because then um, trying to find like the ways to, um, that was a joke, uh, the ways out, I found out that there are uh, 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 pieces from my community. And that's really how I got on. I was kind of surprised, shocked with all these sort of feelings, and I started to share the information to people. And um, what is, uh, I mean, the feelings, the, the, because I, d I dealt with this question of affect, like how do people really react when they encounter these uh, um, belongings in, in, in different formats, like in uh, photographs or, or like, um, or visual, or whatever means like short films. And um, it was not good, I should say. Um, it was very bad. Um, different reactions. What is very interesting is how they also connected, you know, um, um, the moment I showed people like some of the pieces like um, that belong, uh, those that belong to women, for example, like the belt that you gave as an example. You know, we have this belt that one receives at, um, uh, wedding and it plays a really vital role in uh, repro biological reproduction, you know. And uh, when I showed them, people connected this directly to the um, the uh, question of human remains. Like there is no way you can find this uh, all these pieces there. And I think the people's uh, people to, to whom they belonged, uh, their bodies must also be there because they are things that you cannot really you know, give away. And this is, this is, this is the reality. Also, there's, there was also a publication, I think, uh, Human Remains in uh, German East Africa, I think, a book that came out in 2022, I don't remember very well. And you really see like, uh, there's a volume of human remains also from the Maasai community. So it, the reactions, uh, the feelings are really terrible. And uh, the bad thing is that people also believe that these are uh, they, they have been they, they have been affecting the community in different ways. So it's not like uh, you know this really present tense. And they could think like what we saw yesterday in this uh, uh, in the in the empty grave. Uh, you know this effects in Screen, terms of uh, yes exactly uh, in in uh, in terms of fertility in terms of uh, um, calamities like drought. You know decimation of cattle diseases death. So it's still connected because the pieces themselves are are very much connected to life. You know, they are sp the spiritual part of it, of them. You know, it's 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 so it really arose like uh, so much emotional moments to the people. But uh, what I wanted to mention is also that uh, the, the, the very interesting that I was working on ethnographic collections. But people connected that to the question of land. And this is because that's very present. You know, you go to our homeland, for example, 
you can still see like this um farms like um ranches you know um um also parks I must say like many of the parks were also created in a homeland like really Maasai land you think of uh, Serengeti Ngorongoro Manyara National Park Tarangi these really big ones and uh, they could connect to that because you know um this restriction nature you know that they can access and they could think of you know like the people who took the collectors were most likely the same people who took the land and and that really uh, and that's again to go back to the connection that i kind of mentioned in the beginning so um it is in that sense sense when you really connect this to the uh, ongoing land grabbing or dispossession and even like uh, that has been happening since colonial time then they see colonialism uh, in a different way that, 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 than how we see it. So they see it as a very present uh, phenomenon, especially um, given that there are big corporations, big companies, um, more, most of them are these capitalist tourism companies that are grabbing the land and investing into this kind of capitalist investments as well. So it's, which are colonial basically. So it's not of a, more of a memory, but it's really something that's ongoing. And uh, I really wish that we think about that in, in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. is, is that ongoing? You. you mentioned the, the investment, um, investment in the land and land grabbing. Is that land that belongs to the natural parks, or that is land outside of it? Yes. So um, currently, it's more like um, you know. I should probably explain a little bit of how we really utilize the land. So normally, we are pastoralist, and we would really plan in advance because you never know the future, like when there is this long draw time. So there has been an, a kind of a um, so we normally have like these open spaces for grazing and uh, the colonial laws that are existing uh, still in the country uh, would think of that as open, unoccupied land. And they, those are the places that they are really, you know, uh, kind of uh, um, d dispossessing the people. And, uh, I mean, uh, examples, I think you mentioned like what has been going on in... Uh, um, basically in Ngorongoro conservation area, but also in some parts of Loliondo. And now it's even extending to other um, districts in, in northern Tanzania where we mostly reside. And uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not the park. I think it's enlarging, or kind of enlarging or expanding outside the parks. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, my... So it's both, basically, if I understand correctly, it is that um, so human activity inside the natural park is seen as uh, endangering um, wildlife uh, untouched from from human activity, but it is also adjacent uh, land that that are used in a communal way, but do not have a property title, so to speak. Yes, um, that's that, that's it. Yeah, so you have the I mean. The national parks, uh, game reserves have already been, you know, demarcated and uh, they are controlled. They are protected by game rangers, you know, with guns. And you should um, come closer to that. You should not. That's the idea. But um, I mean, yes, um, it's actually this 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 places outside. I, I mean, but also, I mean, um, what is going on is also drawing from. Uh, the colonial time, because I mean, um, this uh, the, the, there is uh, like stages. So some of the places were already declared by during colonial time, like in, before 1960s, as game-controlled areas. And I think that's the path to a game reserve and then a promotion to a national park. So and as a game reserve already, you can't really um, step in uh, whether whether for a livelihood like collecting firewoods or access to whatever water sources, etc. cetera. So um, it is actually these parts that they are referring as gum controlled areas that are being um, are promoted into gum reserves. 
and uh, basically they are within the registered villages. But again, you know, it's super difficult because our land laws also are really weird because, you know, you have like two different um, uh, systems, uh, uh, land ownership uh, system. You have like the state with, you know, the laws, like uh, formal laws, but the customary laws are also recognized, but they are always like really not such powerful. And I mean, land under customary law would always be transformed into whatever kind of our investment that the states want to do. Thank you. I'd like to come back to you, Linda. Um, you, you mentioned funding and financing and the role it plays uh, in, in, in the conflict between the natural parks, how they're being used, and the interest of or the rights of uh, the community who use it uh, the way they used to. So when it comes um, when it comes to the role of German development cooperation in that, um, how how would you describe it, and um, what 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 are the effects on the tensions that exist there? Well, in short, I would say it's a disgrace, and <laughs> disgrace. Not, not very happy that my taxes are being paid for this. So. Um, it has, been, it has been pointed out by both of you, I think, that there's this historic, if you want to call it, historic injustice, which is actually still very mm. present. So there is uh, this attribute of continue to finance nature protection initiatives, which continue to inscribe this historical injustice. So you keep financing projects, protected areas, and initiatives where you say, well, you know, they've been going on for such a long time. We, we haven't actually, you know caused the land conflict, which is another issue, but the German government now says, well, it's been, you know, it's been a long time, we just keep financing it, it's not our fault. So there's these projects where they keep um, financing protected areas and conservation measures which are excluding people, this kind of fortress conservation, which is not the local conservation me methods which you have pointed out, which also exist. And then there's new initiatives which the German development assistance is funding. And Germany is actually, I think, uh, with the US, the second biggest donor for conservation and biodiversity protection to Tanzania. So there's a lot of money going into these projects which are very colonial. They have a very colonial approach to conservation. They do not appreciate these local ideas of conservation. Um, how to manage the land. For example, mm, I don't know, the Maasai have you know, methods of managing the land which we don't perceive as conservation. So what the German government basically funds is the fortress conservation. This idea of people being bad for nature, well, local people being bad for nature, so they need to leave to protect the, the wildlife, while at the same time supporting the development of tourism. So the idea that Local people are bad for nature, but it's no problem if we take a plane to go to Tanzania, go on a safari with a four-wheel drive, stay in a hotel, and then come back, which is apparently good for nature. So the, the whole construct of what the German Development Assistant is funding is embedded in this very colonial idea of what conservation needs to be like. That we need empty spaces, which are for the rich and privileged to enjoy. So it's a you know something that we have seen during colonial times as well, and you know it's it, in this way it's quite shocking. And then of course you have you know some things have changed. You now have rules, regulations. Germany has, for example, ratified a convention which protects the rights of indigenous peoples, which includes rights to consultation and land. So it's legally bind now to respect land rights of indigenous people. And also this, it's disrespecting. And I understand that it's a very difficult situation because everyone is you know, fearing biodiversity loss. It feels like a crisis, like something we need to address urgently. But the thing is that the way we perceive the problem is part of the problem. If we would rethink the way we fund conservation, we wouldn't constantly talk about supposed land conflicts with indigenous communities in protected areas, but we could find other ways to utilize you know, this knowledge, 
that is there, the land management practices that are there, and then we wouldn't need to justify human rights violations by pretending that it's such an urgent crisis we are, we are fighting. So it's quite, yeah, it, it's quite a disgrace to see that the German government keeps funding this model and being a little bit blind towards other models of conservation which exist. Thank you. So that's a whole, a whole topic we would need to look into. Um, <laughs> Uh, funding and support that g comes under nature conservation and biodiversity protection, so to speak. Um, Jimson, from, from your work and your background, which has a bit of a different perspective, do you have this aspect to reconcile between like modern development cooperation projects and uh, development efforts uh, and um, uh, and the like local communities, their traditions um, in this in your work and in this region where where your work is located. Mm, if I understand you well, with the reconciling, can you repeat mm. it again? Yeah, I mean we were spoke we were speaking of of conflicts yeah. between local communities. And um, and uh, institutions uh, like the national parks and interest in the national parks, and the uh, the human rights and, and rights of people who were using them in a in a in a more traditional way. So um, the tension between these two is this uh, something that is happening, you know, or this? Are you seeing that in your work? Not that, uh, not much, but mm -hmm. I'll speak a bit of our experience with uh, that subject. When we speak of people who are living adjacent to the national parks, you might hear from time to time their testimony that possibly they might not need it to be heard loudly mm -hmm. to the government authorities. For instance, before the identification of the national parks, it's testified that they give testimony that they are the one who owned those areas, as my colleague said, so they know how to live with animals. Unlike the Maasai community who never touch the wild animal as meat, in Iroaha National Park people, they live more, more than seven villages are surrounding that national park. Traditional people, they knew how to live with the, the nature, how to live with the wild animal, how to use them as their part of their meals, they will testify that. But since independence or since the demarcation of the national parks, they were not allowed to use, and it's called illegal hunting and poaching with a very serious penalt. So that alone, it keeps the community away from the government and they become enemy to each other. Because these are the ones who knows the traditional way of how to protect animals, but also they know how to trap them. Mm -hmm. So there, there has been from time to time the information about illegal hunting. So the transition or the human life isn't that easy between these uh, communities. So that's why they will put people with guns to protect people, not to protect animals. That's the thing. So usually life isn't that easy. It's the other way around that people are being restricted from hunting. And if they have to hunt for their own traditional life, they have to st they're stealing it. Mm. And there is now when the battle comes between the rangers and the communities. So there, is a, there have been so many cases in Tanzania, uh, especially to the community that are living uh, around the national parks. Sometimes they see these tourists who are coming to enjoy wildlife, even by hunting them, enjoying in five-star hotels, eating. But this one, the poor one, cannot buy this meat. So sometimes they find their own ways, go and hunt maybe for small animals, only for meal. But this alone has been a big battle between the state uh, and the community as well, so if in, in that perspective. I don't have a single case where I'll say there's been a very peaceful transition between the demarcation, between the community living around the national parks and the ordinary, uh, and the government as well. Mm. 
So always it have been a battle. And yeah, for so many reasons that are being given. So you'll hear from the government, you might think you understand them, but when you come to listen to the community, you, you are confused completely because the community is seeing the, uh, the conservation in a different angle than what I've been told by the government. Mm -hmm. So the other one will be order, but the, the community will be the interpretation of what is conservation for them mean. So sometimes there is local way of understanding the conservation that goes deeper to their cultural awareness and the cultural heritage. So they're taught in that because this is how they're raised, how could they live with animals. At a young age, you are told how to avoid a lion, how to avoid to be attacked by an elephant. And I was, I'm told now that if I ask the pastoralist community who are living adjacent to the national park, they will tell you buffalo is more dangerous than a lion, but I'm growing up thinking a lion by look is dangerous than buffalo. Because for me, buffalo is like a, a cow you can slaughter and eat, but it's quite different with them. So you can see all of these are quite different. The perceptions of local communities and the order that are being given by these are conservators who are using guns might be quite different. It's not that easy, mm -hmm. the way I perceive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Laiba, we heard from Linda about the development projects, uh, the effects, the biodiversity approach, et cetera, et cetera. And we heard from you at the beginning how, um, how the legacy of German colonialism, the demarcation of the land, and the wish to create, uh, so to speak, a natural habitat without humans in it. So we heard about that. Now, um, you were talking about your work in German museums, actually, um, um, bringing or, or exposing members of the community to those objects. In this context, um, with that legacy apparently being very present, um, what would you think German actors on the national level or government level, on the level of museums and others, German actors could or should do uh, um, to respect the rights of, of the communities and from the perspective of the communities? Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to be to say I'm pessimistic, but I, maybe not. I think um, um, I think the. I will start with this support, especially when it comes to conservation, creation of nature, wilderness spaces. I think, as Linda said, um, um, so much support is coming from uh, the global north. And uh, we had Germany is really like a, the major and um, other powerful organizations here. And I would think that, um, yeah, I think uh, my suggestion would be that we stop um, funding um, this sort of colonial conservation uh, or fortress conservation that are really um, creating uh, terrible circumstances to people. Um, and instead fund um, some sort of conservations that are that really uh, place at the center the indigenous leadership. I mean, we have heard a lot about, um, I mean, I don't really have to boast myself how we are friendly, uh, we coexist with uh, wild, wildlife in a very, very uh, good way. But I think at least one should be at least um, um, tempted to think of the question like, why, why would we still find many wild animals in Mass Island? Why not in other places? Yeah, I think these are the things. So, and, and think in a very positive way that there is something uh, that uh, the mainstream public uh, doesn't know and maybe they can really learn from us 
and um, push the conservation into a more positive direction. But now thinking about um, um, uh, about uh, so that's I'm um, saying we really have like community conservation practices that are are more ver more um, friendly um, to the people because in the end it's not like we are saying we should not um, have tourism i think it's also beneficial to the local communities and uh, in terms of employment in terms of whatsoever our benefits we can accrue out of that but we are really um we feel very bad with this sort of uh, um you know um this sort of a uh, huge you know investments investors in the end uh, that that would benefit the few in the end but at the cost uh, i mean who who will then be paying the cost is the uh, very very common person in the yeah and um when it comes to the museums uh, i think there is quite a lot uh, to deal with uh, in that respect especially um uh, with the whole question of uh, the objects in our uh, the human remains and uh, it was um, discussed in the last session that you know especially when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, human remains i think uh, there is really a need for a very sensitive process and uh, that would uh, look at it for, from a um perspectives of different communities especially when i think of our uh, human remains from a com Maasai community they have like a very clear process to deal with that especially uh with reconciling because um it's we can't escape from the reality that colonialism really disturbed the social relations and that being it at the family level especially when people cannot really do anything in their family especially in terms of our prayers or whatever rituals because they are missing their loved ones but also are uh, in terms of uh, other really you know ongoing uh, problems as a result of that in terms of infertility i think they, they it was very much uh, well depicted in the uh, film yesterday so i think we should really think more broadly about this and uh, for a Maasai community for example you will never really heal if you don't um, do this with reparation and they have their own way of uh, repairing especially when uh, for for the murder cases uh, that would involve cattle for example uh, with an apology you know cattle uh, settling that with uh, so an also ritual part of it so I think we should really bring the discussion down to the community or communities and uh, really uh, observe that and uh, take that seriously. And also, we should not make it a matter of our simply academic discussions or whatever. I think it was also said yesterday. Let's really feel the pinch, the, the pain that people are feeling there, especially um, the fact that you know um this is the reality is still there that you know we have human remains here we have people's belongings here that are closely connected to them to their families to their bodies and uh, i think um we really need to uh, at least actors in germany will really have to should really have to uh, consider all this from a very serious uh, um uh, stance of viewpoint so uh, there is quite a lot to do and um and i think uh, but also uh, your voices i think you are much more privileged especially when it comes to uh, pointing at injustices and i mean you are, i mean german Gem, germany is not only the supporter but also you know i think they, they it could be very powerful including you all if you really raise your voices especially against uh, all this injustice that we are we have been discussing here so i think everybody uh, has a role to play and uh, if we uh, do that uh, um, diligently i think then we might uh, bring a change thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you So 
Before I open up, you will have the chance, uh, we have like 15 to 20 minutes, we will have the chance for questions from the audience. But I would like um, to give to Linda the floor just before we do that. Um, um, Linda, you represent a human rights organization. You look at the, the rights of indigenous peoples and you mentioned before very clearly um, the German development cooperation um, impact um, and that it has in this respect. So um, through this, uh, f from a human rights aspect, what, what do you think are the priorities? Uh, what is important when you look at the situation of, um, of, of those communities? And um, what, what would be your statement in this respect? Well, <laughs> I think the priorities from speaking for the rights of indigenous peoples is the respect for land, mm -hmm. so no evictions or resettlements, whatever mm -hmm. they're called, without the approval, the pre prior and informed consent of the communities affected, and that's quite you know, strongly regulated in international law and also many national laws. So that's important, just to get, you know, the consent from the communities mm -hmm. if you work on their land. As it's stipulated in the convention you mentioned before. Yeah, right? for example. And it's not correct for the German government to fund initiatives which work on the lands of indigenous peoples without having their consent. Mm -hmm. So it should not fund Tanzanian authorities that do that and it should also not fund German conservation organizations that do that same thing. Mm -hmm. So that should be very clear, that you need to respect indigenous people's land rights. Mm -hmm. It's what human rights require, and I think it has been pointed out by Jimson and Leibor very eloquently, that it would also be beneficial for nature conservation. So I think that is what needs to happen. It's not, it's not super complex, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. To our panelists so far, I'd like to open the floor. Are there questions from the audience? There's one here. If there are more, we collect. Otherwise, yeah. Please, the gentleman there. Thank you very much. My name is Konrad Kunze, and I had the honor to, to work with LIBOR um, and also a little bit counseled by Linda uh, on our theatre performance, Ultimate Safari, which deals especially with the, the evictions of the Maasai and also the colonial aspects of conservation in the past. And I just want to share one impression that we had on our research trip uh, where we actually made a safari. It was necessary to, to get the pictures um, that we used in the performance. And the other one is a, a question, uh, rather. And I want to, to link this Im impression that I had um, to the previous panel, where, which was more about how do we remember the colonial past and so on. Yes? Oh, transferred. Oh, <laughs> without mic. Without mic. Okay, maybe, maybe we find this. Yeah. Probably this mic. I can also speak. Like it's fine. Well, ah, for the translation, it's important. Ah. Okay. Yeah, I hope. This doesn't transfer to the other room. Um, so when you come to Serengeti National Park as a tourist, um, you, there's also a small museum there. And you, Leibow, you mentioned uh, Hermann von Wismann, a colonial criminal. Um, you mentioned the, the so-called punitive expedi uh, expeditions, like where many people are killed and so on. Um, he is kind of honored there as the first person who saved wild animals for future generations without any comment about uh, the criminals. And this is in the National Park of Serengeti. Mm -hmm. And you will also find a beautiful image of um, Bernard Grzimek with um, Julius Nyerere, the first president, 
when you go to the Frankfurt Zoo here in Germany, you will see the same image of Bernhard Grzybek, but they removed Nyerere and replaced him with a small zebra, because that is much more cute. Um, but you basically find the same narration is going on. And this is, of course, not a coincidence. It's because it, both places are made by the Frankfurt Zoological Society, a very colonial institution until today. But this is the impression that you get from, from, yeah, this is the history of the park when you come as a tourist. I just wanted to mention this. And, but the question is more to the future. Um, I just recently um, read that now 5% of the Tanzanian forests were bought by a company called Blue Carbon uh, from the United Arab Emirates. Um, and I just want to ask, what is like your fear or your belief for the future? What does the the um, so-called carbon offset schemes or you know those um, also voluntarily um, uh, carbon credits that many companies uh, in the global north um, buy to name their products as um, climate neutral? Um, what does that mean for future evictions? Is this a, a, a larger threat even than tourism? Or um, how do you see that? Like, I would just like to ask, probably both, all of you uh, can comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. That is, um, so the first part of was a comment that it's obviously something to be done. Uh, to change uh, the the remembrance uh, uh, to to the colonial perpetrators there, but and and then the question uh, on the, on the, on the carbon credits by the company that is based in the Emirates, you said I think right. It is by the way I think in the in the East African region in other countries as much debated uh, as it is in in Tanzania, so. One of you like to answer? All right, uh, let's start. Um, that is very um, booming. It's really um, very much. And um, for me, I think I, I see some kind of a, um, and another kind of colonialism, especially when it comes to land, um, because I think it's pretty much interfering into the livelihood as well. Um, and um, it's also so much into the thinking of nature. And um, I think in, in that respect, I think it, it, it's uh, also... Um, very, very... It's it, it going to have like a... a it, it's even having like a, a very negative uh, effects to uh, people's uh, lives, and um, so I, I I I think this is really uh, it, they go together with uh, whatever uh, colonial conservation that or um, um, nature conservation that we have been discussing. So I think it is really yeah, and uh, also to just comment, uh, I think there is a kind of a shift of uh, the center, you know, and uh, especially to the United Arab uh, Arab Emirates, and uh, I think it is it's it's um, really difficult to think of uh, what's going on, especially um, of, of of their investments and. Uh, you know, there's so much interest into land and this really extractivist um, um, kind of uh, approach to that. And I think blue economy, um, I think it's it's simply part of uh, this, what, what what's called green colonialism, I think. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, to add on what he has uh, said. Yes, please, Jameson. Uh, usually I should say, Historically, when we speak of development of Tanzania, we go back to the colonial time. Mm. And we start with you Germans. Here is where we start. But here came your successor, the British government. And they left us with the same mode of understanding and the coping what you are doing now. When you start to digest, sometimes is when now you come to panic. What's happening to Tanzania? It has got some root from our history as well. Now the country is working hard trying to free itself from economy. 
trying to invite different invi investors. Sometimes working on the political economy in our country. So that's why you will see even within the locality of our own Tanzanians, there's been so much uh, a bit of shift of understanding within these five years, especially with the investment forum. Not only about the about the forest, the eight percent of the land being given being given to someone who is investing in that, but local awareness. There is so much debate in that, so you can see there is a mixed feeling about that. It's somewhere debated also about the water bodies like the investment hubs, so that there is so much confusion going on. Sometimes government being asked difficult questions, trying to answer, but ongoing debate in the country now. We are in a state where a lot of things are happening, but we hope for the future and we hope for the better that the government is trying to do what it can to make her people happy. Maybe this is the case. But now during a process is when now we come to see the international lenses coming in and saying, what's happening here? There is a danger tomorrow. And I can say the danger in Tanzania is not affecting Tanzania alone. In long run, I'm seeing it affects everyone who is in one way or another related to what is happening there. So it's a call for everyone to contribute to whatever you can, but in a very uh, constructive way, maybe in a debate, where there is a chance to do that and to contribute to what you think it can change the situation. But right now, the argument within the locals in Tanzania might be different from the Arabic Emirates, maybe. Because these are two different parts and we are reasoning different. Some that are just maybe projecting that they are doing this because they are extracting oil in their country and now they want maybe to replace it with the green that they find in Tanzania. So it's a question and because it's not a secret anymore, everything that is done is seen in Germany the next day. Everything that is done here in Germany is seen in Tanzania just the next day. Even our live talk now, someone is watching from Tanzania. So everything, the world has become smaller. So there is no way you can hide from the reality. If you want to intend to debate, then you are welcome. It's fine from the bilateral relation, you might be pointing Tanzania. But when it comes to the essence of cultural root, we are all belong to the same. So maybe you are welcome as well to take part. We do have this big organization and others are sitting there where you think you can channel in and advise. You can use it the right way. Otherwise, we will be coming here and addressing these issues as the two parts. But we are no longer two parts. We are being affected the same. The only thing that we might go deep and discuss is the cultural history. This is uh, the one that we are appealing, that the expert from this side should come to Tanzania, and the expert from Tanzania coming in, and then we build a new history of our relations. But the ongoing issues now, it's a really hot debate that everyone needs to be sensitive and then need to be awakened. Let us reduce the number of people who are watching. And all of us come into game and see if the danger happened north, tomorrow will be somewhere in the south. So this is my understanding. Thank you. It took us a long way from the colonial demarcations to blue carbon and carbon credits. Um, are there other? There is one question over there. Yes, please. Yes, please. Oh, it's not working. Thank you. My name is Ramona Seitz. I'm a student and a freelance journalist. And um, I have a question to maybe Liber or maybe all of you. As for, can you elaborate to the audience um, how in Tanzania the word indigenous is seen, maybe also in difference to other countries where we see movements for more rights for indigenous people? And um, also, as it's about, um, which might have a lot to do with the nation building, but also when it comes to these other topics we have here with human remains, repatriation, restitution, where somehow it seems stuck and the Tanzanian government is, 
very slow from our perspective. Can you try to explain to us what this relation nation state and communities and um, also we, we heard about the first president Nyerere and Jemek also the the visions at that time to create Tanzanians and uh, that people shall be Tanzanians first which has also created a very peaceful country with many ethnicities living together peacefully but um, here we're talking about protecting nature Yet, what is about protecting cultures? Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe I can make a comment about the indigenous, um, indigenous peoples as opposed to everyone being indigenous. I know that it, that is a debate in I think it's mostly in African states and not so much in other parts of the world, which is, of course, due to colonialism. I think the problem is that it is then, indigenous peoples is then understood as though if you use the term and a group is considered indigenous, it would somehow, you know, have particular rights over other groups. And I think that is a, a certain misunderstanding because what indigenous rights are for is to support groups which are marginalized and have specific needs, for example, the very strong attachment to the land uh, for their livelihoods, to enable them to exercise their human rights like everyone else. So in that way, indigenous isn't about you know giving something to someone and not giving it to the others, but it's about creating, um, so to say, a level playing field of enabling people which are indigenous, and I know that's quite Con has been quite contested by the Tanzanian government, um, enabling them to basically live a life like everyone else. So it's a more an integrative thing, even though sometimes it's coined as being something exclusionary. And in the, in the Tanzanian context, especially after the evictions uh, in Loliondo, which turned violent, I know that the Tanzanian government, for example, in UN forums, contested that the Maasai are indigenous, Uh, and it sometimes blamed them to having migrated from someone that actually being true indigenous people. So it's become quite a political instrument, but I think that we need to differentiate that from the actual intention of indigenous people's rights. And otherwise there is no you know, fixed definition of indigenous. It has a lot to do with self-identification as well. So you know, for someone like me to say, you know, they're indigenous, they're not, that is not going to work. Yeah, thanks. I think you put it very well. So, um, looking uh, looking at it from that uh, in that way, then uh, the Maasai can be indigenous, especially how we perceive ourselves when we are fighting for our rights and positioning ourselves also to uh, um, you know the international movements that have to do with uh, uh, indigenous people or peoples. And um, we are not indigenous, actually, uh, especially when uh, uh, the government, let's say, uh, needs to justify, you know, um, the uh, evictions, for example. Yeah, so it's vo a volatile term, you would say. Um, yes, and uh, the other question was about... Um, if, oh, yeah, the communities and the nation. I think uh, there is a very... Uh, there is, there is um, I would say, like a, a kind of a divergent um, understanding. So, especially when it comes to addressing uh, the issues with the museums, I think, and it goes either way, right? Um, so, the German government will say, you know, we need to uh, be in touch with the um, formal structures back in Tanzania. You know, like um, the government, the ministry, and uh, it's the institutions under under it, like the National Museum, let's say in Dar es Salaam, and uh, so this this sort of uh, formality, and uh, I think that really diverges uh, quite much from uh, the community's uh, need, 
and that that could also uh, that's that's also the case when it comes to you know the aspects like let's say with reparations you know so um, government to government let's say uh, level we will I mean the government will think of our reparations in terms of whatever social services or constructing roads or whatever are big big funding but to the locals I think especially people at the grassroots then it translates into something else this uh, sort of uh, reconciliation with uh, apologies um, also repairing in terms of uh, basically in, in, in the course of their customary laws if you like and uh, this, these are not necessarily meeting somewhere. And um, yeah, you asked something about uh, culture. Protecting, uh, protecting, uh, protecting, uh, yes. So that's also um, at the center. Like uh, the moment you discuss about, let's say, um, collections here, like they are from different communities and uh, the government will be, or uh, is afraid that, you know, that. It's a kind of promoting ethnicity. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, uh, the Nyerere's uh, first president policies were against. Um, yeah, but yet it's it's uh, very um, uh, obvious that you know um, different cultures are still there. I think more than 120 ethnic groups, and many are still practicing their cultures, and you cannot really. Um, uh, avoid that, and I think it's it's not in any case uh, leading to any uh, politics uh, driven in uh, I mean uh, tribalism uh, kind of yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, if I were to add on that, sorry, in just a minute, I could identify myself as an indigenous people during the colonial time, saying I'm from the Hehe, from Umkwava. This, the story that's less is spoken here in Germany anyway, because sometimes it sounds like a shaming the nation. Because this is the story that comes before Majimaji. So somewhere in 1891, I would stand saying, I'm an indigenous person from this clan that defeated the von Zelewski in 1891. And I'm proud of that. So I won't count the other eight years of fighting but still I'm remaining the same when I'm ruled by the German and the, the British people. But soon after independence, you don't count that. I'm proudly coming from Kwava chiefdom, that's the indigenarity. But soon after now, the independence, we turn into different ethnicities that were demarcated by the colonial government. And now our first, polit uh, our, our first state head of the state decided to take it other round, that we, I, we must confuse this type of practice of saying it's us and it's you, then we mixed up to form a new nation. So we had 10 years of nationalization between 1961 and 1970. That alone affects us until today. So the only place where we meet and saying, I'm the origin from somewhere, is when now we are looking for the historical part of it. We want to understand our relation to the history part. And in my understanding, we have a few ethnic groups that they remain touched to their before cultural artifact, that they are not affected much by the independence, unification of ethnic groups, and the Maasai being one of them. They play both, that they will be in the mixed part, but yet if you trace them, you find they're still living in their cultural roots back. So that is the difference. We are having like three uh, ethnic groups, but the rest of it, we are having 120 tribes or 120 ethnic groups, but who are mixed up. So it's a bit of a confusion that at the end, if you ask my indigenarity, then I will say, I'm, a, I'm a, an indigenous Tanzanian. And that made us, wherever you're going to find a Tanzanian, you feel at home, you don't count the other. When I came to Germany and I found a ball, then I was in a very safe hand just going to him every day. So we don't have those type of like uh, demarcations. We are one as a nation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda, Jimson, and Leiber. I'd like to close the panel. Thank you for your questions. And I'm supposed to say something. My colleague is telling me there. Lunch, uh, yes, 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 yes. Of course, there is lunch. 
adjust down the stairs, please, in the main hall downstairs. Thank you very much.